All right, let's get started like we normally do. Short period of bell meditation. Wherever you are behind your avatar, get into a nice meditation posture. And as I ring the Ching bell, remember, just focus on the sound of the bell. Really get your deep listening going today so we can all absorb some Dharma. You're going to get distracted. happens to all of us. When it does, again, just gently remind yourself and say, yeah, I need to be focusing on the sound of the bell. And just go back to it. Uh, then, of course, short pause after the meditation, three recitations, and then on with the talk for today. So I'll give you a moment. Get into a nice meditation posture. We'll begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the taught. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. And... Welcome again, everybody. Happy Friday. Here we are, Buddha Center, Temple. Good to see so many folks. Yay. Uh, today we're going to talk about authentic Dharma. So, as by now, uh, if you've been you know, exploring the path for a short time or even a long time, You've figured out that dipping your toes into this vast river of Buddhist teachings that just keeps flowing by, that it can be frustrating and it can be confusing, and rightfully so. Uh, the language that you encounter, the concepts, the practice, it can seem alien 
to us Westerners. Uh, so you might want to enter the stream, but you're not really sure how to reach the other side of it, or even if you need to. So you're told that the Buddha never wrote anything down, but the Pali Nikayas contain sutras that are said to be his words written down from many four months after Siddhartha's death. And, and then there are other texts. There are texts and sutras. There's hundreds of them. But they were written sometimes thousands of years after the death of the Buddha. And in every country, hello Madison, happy Friday. In every country that Buddhism touched, there arose teachers and there arose scholars. And it didn't matter if it was Chinese, Tibetan, Sri Lankan, Japanese, and many more. From the Theravada and the Mahayana, Tibetan and Japanese, Nichiren and Pure Land, from all these traditions and others came uh, canonical writings and commentaries that were meant to offer the Dharma through the lens of each particular tradition. All of it claims to be Dharma. And in some sense, they are all Dharma. As long as the lessons that we can find in them, uh, we can link them to the Four Noble Truths. We can do that through our own experiential verification. In every tradition, and this includes other religions other than Buddhism, or other belief systems other than Buddhism, in every one of them, there are teachings that can bring value to our moment-to-moment -moment practice, especially in this contemporary time, you know, this culture that we have to deal with. <clears throat> Excuse me. So authenticity. Authenticity of teaching and of teacher is wanted. But it's also been argued over for thousands of years. What makes it authentic? What makes the teaching authentic? What makes the teacher authentic? Well, the question is, in this contemporary moment, is authenticity the key to offering the Dharma? For example, in the Tibetan tradition, rather than focusing on the authenticity of, you know, who wrote that, or when was it practiced, or, or excuse me, when was it written, when was it, or who wrote it, what country was it written in, how long after the Buddha's death was it written, instead of all that, the focus is on the efficacy of the teaching. Does it work? Does it help with the alleviation of suffering? Does it help advance human flourishing? If it does that, we need to take a deeper look at it. Maybe even practice it a little more. So how does this add positively to our practice then? Or how does it add positively? That's the question. And we have to determine that through actually engaging the teaching in our moment-to-moment -moment life. That's kind of what Buddhism is all about, engaging the practice in moment-to-moment -moment life. And that way, the efficacy of any teaching is realized through our own actions. There's that, four, that uh, eightfold path slipping its way in there. Oh, did Delaney come in? Hello, Delaney. Oh. Delaney, howdy. Good to see you. So I'm going to look to, since I've been talking a little about Tibetan, let's look at Sekyong Mimpom, Mipom Rinpoche. Uh, he's the head of the Shambhala lineage and of Shambhala International. Uh, this is a network of urban Buddhist meditation centers and rural retreat centers and monasteries a university, and there's some other enterprises. And these were all founded by his father. Uh, his father is the late Buddhist master, Chilyang Trungpa Rinpoche. Well, his son promotes intent rather than rule, wisdom rather than knowledge, as being more important in Buddhist practice. So again, intent rather than the rule, or dogma, if you will, and wisdom rather than just the knowledge, because we can all have a bunch of knowledge in our head, but can we use it wisely? So he has this book. It's called The Sword of Wisdom. It's quite a good book. And in there is a quote where he says, If you do not have such understanding, then, like a blind man leaning on his staff, you can rely on fame, mere words, or what is easy to understand. 
and go against the logic of the four reliances. And later in that same interview, or a later interview, he also said this, the question of authorship was an important one for early Buddhists concerned with authenticity. But over the centuries, it has become less so. Nowadays, Buddhists resolve this issue by considering the teaching contained in the text on its own merits. Accordingly, the principle of the Four Reliances has developed to deal with this issue. We, urge, we are urged to rely on the teaching and not the author, the meaning and not the letter, the truth and not the convention, the knowledge and not the information. Thus, if a teaching accords with the Dharma, then the teacher must have been a Buddha or someone empowered by a Buddha to speak on his or her behalf." Unquote. I want to pull one little thing out of there. Some of you have heard me say this before. We, we look at information and knowledge a little differently. Information is stuff that we have in our head that we can answer questions with or you know, we go do trivia night. Knowledge is that information turned into action, where we actually experience it and see how it works for us. And that's what really turns it into knowledge, is when we become active with it. So, now we're going to talk about these four reliances uh, that Mipham Rinpoche was talking about. Again, they're from the Tibetan tradition. Uh, and it is Dharma. And it's Dharma that can help us bring about real understanding that arises from how we experience the actions connected with the words. This is when we take the words and turn them into action. The four standards of appropriate dharma, which should be relied upon and abided by. Now, before we go any further, a little thing about abide. You'll hear this word quite a bit, you know, in, especially in the Tibetan tradition. What this is, this is an acceptance through experience that one thought or action is effective. Then making those thoughts and actions integral to how one interacts with the causal world. So it's putting knowledge to work. And accepting that your experience from that is a real one. So you abide in what you learn. You abide in your vows. So let's look at these four standards. The first one is to abide by the Dharma, not the person. No perfect person has or ever will teach the Dharma. Even Siddhartha. Siddhartha was constantly refining his humanness until the moment of his death, the moment of his parinibbana. Trungpa Rinpoche, who I mentioned earlier, he had some serious difficulties with alcohol and sex. And for a time, he set aside the robes of a tulku. And then we've got Martin Luther King Jr. He was a known womanizer. Yet, the lessons that each of these individuals had to offer hold a great value for developing how we are, but also how we can be. They're examples. To experience the Dharma, one must look past personality and fame and abide by the lessons that work to promote liberation from suffering and human flourishing, happiness, health, and harmony. So abide by the Dharma, not the person. Right? There's lots of what are, what are called celebrity Buddhists around these days. And they all have opinions, they all have commentaries, they all have these things, and we should look at them when we can. You know, we can't look at all of it, there's so much of it, but with an open mind and an open heart and see, can I abide by their dharma? And look past who they are. Next one. Abide by the sutras of ultimate truth not the sutras of incomplete truth. Interesting one. The Buddha made it clear that the Dharma was subject to impermanence and codependent arising. Like he said this, 
quote, all dharmas are forms of emptiness, unquote. Emptiness being the idea that there's always room for that transformation. And it's going to happen. If all things undergo transformation, all phenomena, no matter what they are, then the dharma is no exception. So this would preclude, then, the idea of any sort of ultimate truth, wouldn't it? Or a truth that would remain true no matter the time, no matter the context, no matter the situation. Because that's what ultimate truth would mean. Now, some Buddhist teachers say that suffering is an ultimate truth of human existence. Kind of feels like it. Because in our present moment, it would be difficult to disagree. Look around. I mean, look at your own life. You obviously, you know, all of us go through some kind of suffering, and we can just look at the world around us and see just all kinds of suffering. So we know that right now, we can't disagree that suffering is a factor in human existence. But what about 100 or 200 or 1,000 years from now? What if, through the efforts of countless Buddhists and others, whose goal is the alleviation of suffering, what if it succeeds? Well, then, would suffering still be an ultimate truth? So there's no overriding ultimate truth in a contemporary traditionalist or a pragmatic view of Buddhist philosophy and practice. That impermanence and causal conditioning are factors in all phenomena, well, then an ultimate truth can only be viewed as a teaching that works in a particular situation. Because ultimately it works. The lessons taught in some sutras will have relevance in a particular moment, but in the next moment, they would be incomplete truths because they don't work. So each truth, then, would arise from the experience of applying the Dharma, or experiential verification. Not from the Dharma itself. The Dharma is the tool. We put the tool in action. Does it fix it or not? Does it make it work better or not? Each truth is codependent on how one applies the Dharma in each unique situation we encounter. And every moment is unique. Third one. To abide by the meaning, not the word. Now, you guys hear me say all the time, it, it's intent. We look at intent. We could change the word meaning here to intent. To abide by the intent, not the word. And we'd get the same intent. You'll pardon the expression there. Um, so, two words I can say for this, resist dogmatism. The written word, when you put it down on paper, or on the computer, or whatever, it gives the illusion of permanence. It's there, it's always going to be there. An illusion that can result, though, in those words gaining a lot more importance than what they were originally meant to convey. I see this a lot with fiction that I like to read. You know, read a good book of fiction, you really enjoy it, the story's great and all that, and then you hear a thing about somebody taking it apart down to its psychological impact on humanity or whatever. It's like, well, can't we just enjoy the book instead of giving those words that much more meaning? For example, in the Sigalavada Sutta, uh, the Buddha speaks with Sigala, the young householder, about the importance of the commitments in the relationship of husband and wife. This is not the only one he does that with, but this is germane to what we're talking about here. So he offered to Sagala that by acting on the commitments of honor, respect, fidelity, budgeting wisely, acting skillfully, organizing duties, showing hospitality to friends and family, sharing authority, and showing each other appreciation, that a husband and wife would have a relationship that was grounded in loving kindness. And certainly, there's truth in that traditional view. Absolutely. But today, can we limit the value of the Siglovada Sutta by continuing to apply the lessons of the Sutra to a married couple, a man and a woman? Or... Do we need to accept the realities of this contemporary life and culture and extend the teachings 
to domestic partners no matter what combination they come in? The answer is yes. The Dharma's dynamic, our lives are dynamic. We're much different than 2,600 or so years ago, the lives that we lead. So yes, we have to expand it. Because there's a certain Dharma that we have to gather into that fold, if you will. And that's the fact that not all partnerships are a man and a woman anymore. So abide by the intent or the meaning, not the word. And the last is to abide by the wisdom, not the knowledge. For a contemporary Buddhist practitioner, there are thousands of books on Buddhism. Oh my gosh, just go to any bookstore or look on Amazon or on your local library. There's bunches of them. You can get one about every flavor of Buddhism, every tradition in Buddhism. You can find something. And then we got to look at videos and blogs and Buddhist temples that are available and Buddhist groups that you can find um, all over the country. None of these things are hard to find. Now, personally, I began my journey on the Noble Path as a book Buddhist. Uh, a book Buddhist. This is one that, that gathers up all kinds of reading material and uh, gathers the knowledge of the how and the when and the why and the who and the where of Buddhism. And wow, did I feel good. That made me feel really good to have all that information in my head. And when somebody asked me to fill out a form and there was that religious preference line, well, of course, I put Buddhist. And that made me feel good. But what I was then was an example of recognition without realization or knowledge without wisdom. And that wasn't so good. When that realization hit, then it was a not such a good thing. So until I actually learned to make the lessons of the Dharma part of how I responded to life on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, did that knowledge begin to change into wisdom? And a little more wisdom would start to arise. So knowledge only has value when it becomes an actionable component of how you are. Then it transforms into wisdom realized. Abiding by the wisdom, not the knowledge. So the four reliances, these are all about getting past the delusions that can come with our moment-to-moment our -moment encounters with people and places and things. It isn't who or what offers the lessons of the Dharma. You know, and you guys have heard me find Dharma lessons in fiction books and science fiction and movies and other media that's non-Buddhist. Because in the end, it's how you apply and how you recognize and then how you realize whatever those teachings might be as an integral part of how you are. It's up to you. Aha, there's that personal responsibility thing jumping out again. It, it, you have to turn knowledge into wisdom. <clears throat> there's no book or video or teacher that is the Dharma. They're only a conduit of the knowledge that comes with putting the Dharma into practice. And they're examples of the wisdom that can arise through effort and commitment. This includes the Buddha. The core lessons of the Four Alliances isn't, it is that it isn't an external person, like a guru or a teacher. And it isn't the words, and sometimes it's not even the knowledge that is meant to be relied on. The lesson ultimately is that a Buddhist practitioner, you and I, must rely on themselves to turn words into actions and knowledge into wisdom. So this is how we abide. We abide with the wisdom. We abide by the meaning or the intent. We abide by the ultimate truth in the moment. And we abide by the Dharma. 
we find ourselves abiding in, in these four ways, then our strength of practice is certainly going to improve. It's going to mature, and you're going to be able to come to an acceptance of parts of the Dharma maybe that you couldn't in the past. Remember, we can't take it all in at once, right? It's a process. So abide in the process. Abide in the practice.